Awesome. Um, and thank you everybody for um, coming. It's it's wonderful to see how many attendees you are here. And I was so excited at this opportunity to work with the Early Career Committee to, to host this event and have some really amazing um, speakers here today to talk about both the academic work and uh, the work that they're doing to foster diversity and inclusion in their own um, spaces. So um, I'm just going to go through some introductions. So first we've got Dr. Sarah Gaither, who is an assist assistant professor in psychology and neuroscience at um, Duke University. She runs the Duke Identity and Diversity Lab. Um, she was recently named the Sage Young Scholar Award by SPSP. And um, as of uh, today or yesterday, the Michelle Alexander Early Career Award for Scholarship and Service. Um, she's one of the, uh, the, the other co-chairs of the SPSP Early Career Committee with me. And her research focuses on how multiple social identities shift our behaviors and perceptions of others, um, with a particular emphasis on social identity threat and multiracial and multicultural experiences. Um, next, we've got Dr. Valerie Taylor, Dr. Valerie Jones Taylor, sorry, um, an assistant professor of psychology and Africana studies at Lehigh University. Um, she earned her doctorate in social psych at Stanford and a BA in Psychology and Ethnic Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. And before joining Lehigh, she served as an assistant professor at Spelman College and was a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton. Um, her research areas include integrate relations, social identity threat, stereotyping and discrimination, and cultural psychology. And specifically, um, Dr. Jones Taylor investigates how stereotyping and prejudice affect the academic performance of underrepresented groups interracial interactions and the treatment of minorities and racialized physical spaces using traditional research methodologies and virtual reality. Um, we also joined today with Dr. John, John Freeman. Um, he's an assistant professor at uh, New York University and his research focuses on how we perceive other people and specifically how we categorize others into social groups, infer their emotion or personality via facial cues and more generally how we understand and react to our social world. Um, he's, uh, he's received a number of awards, including the Early Career Award from the Society for Social Neuroscience, um, the Sage Young Scholars Award, and at the moment he serves on the SPSP Diversity and Climate Committee and on the NIH Advisory Committee to the Directors Working Group on Diversity. And last but certainly not least, we've got Dr. Kathleen Bogart, who's an assistant professor of psychology and the director of the Disability and Social Interaction Lab at Oregon State University. Um, Dr. Bogart is a social and health psychologist specializing in ableism and rare disorders such as facial paralysis. Um, her research focuses on the forgotten ism, ableism, and prejudice towards disability. And she studies disability from a social psychological perspective, examining others' attitudes towards disability and the way that people with disabilities adapt to their conditions, develop identities and manage stigma. So you can see that we've got an amazing lineup of speakers here with some really interesting and diverse perspectives on this issue. Um, so with that, we're just gonna jump straight in. Um, and I've first got a general question. Um, so what are some of the, best or worst practices you've seen or heard regarding creating inclusive research or teaching spaces? Um, maybe Sarah, do you want to start us off here? Sure, and thank you again to everyone for logging on and watching the recordings later if you're watching this later on. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about something that I've been pushing a lot at my own university and it's something that I find early career scholars are really unaware of on their campuses, which is work study programs. Um, many students who are limited income do get special financial aid packages. And so if students have the choice of working in a gym and folding towels, for example, versus that same money can be applied with you actually working in a research lab, it can actually really increase the number of underrepresented students that can get research experience. We know that people can, who can afford to work for free and to have the research opportunities over the summer. But for many students, they have to often choose between an unpaid research position or a paid work study position. And so I want to make sure that everyone um, listening today is really looking into their respective university work study programs. It can cut down your hourly rates to be 100% free, 25% covered, 50% covered. Um, and it's something that I've been really, really pushing people to consider in their work um, and research spaces going forward. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. Um, did any of our other panelists anything to add? Uh, Valerie, maybe? 
Yes, I also wanted to note that we are really, we tend to be really good at offering um, different organizations for underrepresented students on our campuses, particularly undergrads to get involved in. And of course that's great, but I've recently been thinking a lot about ways to encourage students to um, be allies and collaborators to come alongside these students. And so we've been thinking about beginning organizations that explicitly encourage people to be in allyship building relationships to use psychological science to sort of meet these goals. And in this moment, post George Floyd and everything else we have going on, we know a lot of students want to be involved, but they don't quite feel empowered to be involved. Sometimes if they don't belong to a particular um, underrepresented group. And I think this is a really important way to begin encouraging that allyship building that we've seen in the history of this country um, across all social movements. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so I think, uh, um, unless uh, Kathleen or John you wanted to add, I think we'll move on to the next question, which is um, directed at you, John. Um, so John, you've spearheaded efforts to make um, NSF, the National Science Foundation, more inclusive by acknowledging LGBTQ individuals. Could you tell us a little bit more about what motivated you to start those petitions and the steps that you've taken um, to, to address this? Sure. Um, so the the so I, as you said, I've been doing uh, an effort to have the National Science Foundation include sexual orientation and gender identity demographic questions in their national STEM workforce surveys. So a, a lot of you watching are probably PhD students, and when you finish your PhD, you're going to take something called the Survey of Earned Doctorates. It's pretty much required to take to to dissertate and graduate. And those, right, these are, these are surveys of the scientific workforce that feed into congressionally mandated reports that are used by Congress, by policymakers, by researchers in STEM, STEM education researchers. So without the demographic data, you can't officially inform national and university policies or create more inclusive and diverse spaces sort of armed with appropriate data. So while you can do a small you know, education study looking at sexual and gender minorities, although there's only very few studies, that's not gonna actually feed into policy and to changes. So just one immediate thing that might be relevant to you is national research service awards from the NIH or graduate research fellowship programs rely on these exact data sets to know what it specifically is under representation in terms of different groups. Um, so what motivated me to do that, I think was this feeling that sexual and gender minorities or you know, uh, biases on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity are not often discussed, unfortunately, in STEM diversity discussions, generally speaking. I think in social psychology, we do, I think, fortunately, an amazing job with, I mean, we can always do better, but compared to neuroscience, right, compared to other STEM fields, physics, we're we do quite well, I think, in terms of having a broad look um, like we're seeing today in this discussion. In most cases, sexual orientation and gender identity is seen as almost anth antithetical to science and engineering, that those are too uh, private and too inappropriate to be discussing in the professional context of, of science and engineering. And that, I think, has the result of kind of erasing these identities and, and stymieing efforts to actually create more inclusive and supportive states uh, and, uh, spaces. And the, I'll just briefly say that all the, all the available data on LGBTQ disparities in STEM, it's quite alarming. The, the, you know, the most recent data suggests that the sex orientation gap in terms of earning STEM degrees is larger than the racial gap, it's smaller than the gender gap. So these are, these are quite large gaps and it's important to try to rectify these. And the only way to try to make headway with that, in my view, is getting the National Science Foundation to include these questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is, sounds very interesting. I mean, I followed this um, uh, with, with great interest over the, over the last few years. And it's wonderful to, to see that work. And maybe we can bring that over to the UK a little bit more as well um, in the future. Um, so my next question is for Valerie. Um, so Valerie, you've recently been um, considering uh, revamping teaching of undergraduate stats to make them more inviting for under 
for underrepresented students. Could you tell us a little bit more about this? Um, yes. Um, so I just want to first note that the goal to do this, in my view, is relatively simple, um, but it just takes, of course, a little bit of effort. Um, and we must first know who our students are. So doing those quick surveys that we often do at the beginning of the course, just to ask about people's interests and other sorts of things I think is really important. Um, but really the one of the most important things we can do as um, educators is to incorporate content and articles that simply highlight diverse researchers and the topics that they study. And this is important because um, we know that this will um, normalize the integration, normalizing this will um, make it seem, of course, quite natural to our students um, to know that there are a diverse uh, range of views, topics to be studied. Um, and this is really important um, for uh, marginalized students because it helps, we can often highlight some of the experiences that they've had. So for instance, if um, I'll sometimes include Dr. Uh, Jennifer Eberhardt's research on the bi-directional um, race uh, crime link, for example, as we talk about ANOVAs or T-tests and all these sorts of things. And it really draws students in. And we know for minority students, they often must see utility value in the work that they do specifically as it relates to STEM content. Um, and that's, you know, for all students, of course, as well. And so being able to make those connections with the research and people's lived experiences is important. Of course, the whole, um, con all the content in these classes doesn't have to be that way, but it is a really good start to do that and to be intentional about um, not focusing on any one particular marginalized group or identity as well. And to do that um, by integrating the research that you do in your labs with your undergraduate students there um, would be important as well. And the last thing I wanted to note is to help with this goal, uh, uh, recently on the SPSP listserv, there was um, a Google Doc, editable Google Doc, to include researchers, um, BIPOC researchers of different research areas, and you can find their um, articles. And so this is a database that we could search if you need a little help to sort of get us along that goal. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, that all sounds really interesting and um, very important, I think. Uh, we're going to have to look into doing some of that. Um, thank you. Um, the, the next question we're going to move is to Kathleen. Um, so hi, Kathleen. Um, you've been an advocate both on your campus and elsewhere for disability visibility efforts. Could you give us some specific examples about these efforts and the type of changes that they've led to either on campus or elsewhere? Sure, um, happy to do that. Um, so, you know, first a bit of context about disability in terms of diversity. Um, you know, so so like some of the other identities we're talking about today, um, diver disability is especially underrepresented in higher education. Um, so we think that about 25% of American adults have a disability, um, yet we know that even in undergrads, only 11% of undergrads have uh, disabilities and they're 16% less likely to graduate from undergrad, let alone move on. Um, so this is a very large minority group um, that's, that's quite underrepresented. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've done a lot of work um, in terms of teaching, research, and service um, around these issues. Um, so I can talk about teaching first. Um, so uh, some early work with colleagues, we actually um, examined the, the content of uh, all of the main psychology department offerings um, in the US. We found that fewer than 30% offered one course that significantly focused on disability. Um, and so there actually, as far as we knew, were only a handful of classes that actually uh, specialized in disability. Um, and so after that, I developed one of those. So I'm, you know, one handful plus one. Um, and so what I've done with that class, um, it, you know, we offer it every year. It's been going for, I think, seven years now. Um, and we do things like really normalize the discussion around disability. Um, 
So, for example, in this class, I, um, I disclose my own uh, disability identity, and I find, too, that uh, students are more likely to um, feel less stigmatized about their own disability, more likely to come out. And uh, after almost every class, I have a student contact me and say, you know, I knew I had a disability, I had this diagnosis, but I didn't want OSU to know about it. And now I've gone to our disability access services and um, requested the services that I am entitled to as my you know, civil right. Um, and, you know, these students just thrive after that, right? Um, so they get the, uh, the accommodations they need and, it, you know, some of that stigma is reduced. So we, you know, my goal is really to see this happen at a much larger level. So with some colleagues, we put together a set of teaching resources um, through Teaching of Psychology. I can send a link later if anyone uh, wants to contact me. Uh, but this is a resource that uh, really covers all of the major topics that you might see in an Intro to Psych class and um, has specific learning modules and videos that can incorporate disability representation into those um, conversations. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what I've been doing with teaching. Um, with research, I also think it's really important to um, be sure that disability is represented at the table. Um, so most of my research actually focuses on disabled people as participants, um, but I really try to follow a participatory action research process, which means that um, the, the people who, uh, whose lives we are trying to understand and better um, have a seat at the table as collaborators. So I always include um, disabled collaborators, support groups, um, focus groups, um, incorporate advocacy groups um, in the design and interpretation of my research. And I also am always sure to um, communicate the results back to participants, right? That's something that is so happen so often happens to marginalized groups is that um, they are the subjects of research, they're poked and prodded and asked, uh, you know, outrageous questions, and then they never hear about what, what became of that work that they participated in. So, you know, I always give out um, what I hope is an accessible, simple summary. Um, I often give webinars and presentations, panels like this, with um, disability advocacy groups, so it gives back to that community. Um, and last, you know, in terms of outreach, I really like to engage my students um, in terms of helping them to, to be allies. I'll bounce off of what um, Valerie was suggesting earlier. There's so many um, students who care about these issues but don't feel empowered uh, to engage. So, you know, we have some sort of awareness or pride event every year around disability or rare disorders, and it really uh, is designed by and for the students, and they play a major role in it. Um, and I think it's uh, really a, a good opportunity for them to communicate about the you know, work they're doing in the lab. We often get psych high or psychology club involved as well, so it kind of goes beyond our just our lab. Thank you. That's um, that all sounds wonderful. I love the way that you're bringing in the undergraduate students and, and the wider community into the research. And um, that sounds that sounds wonderful. And is a very nice uh, segue to my next question, which is directed at um, Sarah. Um, so Sarah, you run um, a very large lab, as I understand it, with around twenty five undergrads. Um, which is very, a lot to me, at least from the UK, um, a large lab with about 25 undergrads from diverse backgrounds every term. So could you tell us about some of the tactics that you use to help create this productive and inclusive research space? Um, and perhaps particularly at the moment um, with COVID and the, the times that we find, our, find ourselves in. Yeah, so my lab is, we call it the lab family, um, is the first thing. So I think how you brand your lab is really important. Obviously, the word diversity is in my lab. So I have, obviously, a sampling bias in the types of students who are going to apply to work with me in the first place. Um, but I do think how you brand your lab, how you center your lab, everyone in my lab gets a lab t-shirt. Uh, there's always lab candy. I bring in food all the time. 
I also, even though I'm pre-tenure and people have told me not to do this, but I do it anyway, um, do stop by the lab during popular shift times when we were all in person to make sure that the students actually see me as a faculty member as often as possible. Um, I've also instituted grad student kind of office hours where they also need to physically be present in the lab and that way undergraduate research assistants, particular underrepresented students, don't feel abused in the process of the busy work that sometimes is research. Um, and so some other tactics I find are really, really helpful is to also never assume that all students are coming in with the same set of skills. And so starting very broadly, making sure that students actually know what a Qualtrics survey is, they might not. And some underrepresented students in particular might not feel empowered enough to speak up and ask those questions. So even if you think something might be boring or too dull for a given group, I would not make any assumptions with anyone coming into your lab because that helps them rebuild their skills and actually revisit things in new ways. I find even for my students who know how to use Excel or R or SPSS, whatever the case may be. Um, the other recent thing that we've done in our lab, which got really positive feedback, particularly during this COVID term, we did have about 10 students who still came into the lab socially distanced in separate testing rooms. So it was definitely not as fun. Um, we had about 15 who were all virtual across the country. Um, we actually did a joint value statement writing task where all the undergraduates, graduate students, and postdocs worked together to write a value statement that's now publicly available on our website. Um, this was a really inclusive process so then all the students could make sure their voices were heard. They could communicate their own words anonymously through this process and it was a really nice lab building experience for us, particularly during COVID. We also started using Slack a lot more during COVID, which made it much easier for the numbers of emails since students are getting so many from the university with COVID protocols. So being creative on what forms of communication work best for your students is another way to make sure no students sort of get left behind um, during these COVID terms as well. So those are just some best practices. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, so we've now heard a little bit um, from each of our four panelists uh, specifically. So we're gonna now open it up a little bit again for some more general questions. Um, uh, so I'd next like us to talk about, um, this is for all panelists, with pushes for anti-bias curriculum and campus changes, what are some things that you would hope that your university and others might be able to do to, to help create a more representative and inclusive classroom spaces? What would your hopes be moving forward? Um, um, and any of you feel free to, to just jump in here. I can start. Um, I was part of Duke's recent race and bias task force. And so we actually talked about a lot of ways that Duke is going to be shifting not only their curriculum, but their hiring practices. So I think one of the best things that universities, regardless of what university type you might be at, is to really think about who you're hiring and who you're not hiring going forward. Because really it is the faculty that tend to push these changes as much as students love being the activists on their campus and they should do those things. It's the faculty that tend to have more power in creating these changes. So I'd first push all of you to really consider if you're on search committees this year or next year, consider what those criteria are for those searches, um, what types of values they might have. Um, we've started requiring diversity training for all faculty search committees going forward at Duke. I think those are really important as much as we all like to believe we don't have biases, we all of course do. Um, and I think the other things that we've been talking about a lot at Duke as we're shifting our curriculum requirements now require and equality awareness training for all of our undergraduates going forward is to make sure that underrepresented faculty are not going to be overburdened with the new work going forward with these curriculums. Um, so it's really important for all faculty, regardless of their identities or backgrounds, to make sure that they are signing up for these anti-bias training sessions, these curriculum training sessions, so that this extra labor isn't going to fall on our underrepresented scholars more than it already has in the past. And so finding that balance, I think, is something that's really critical for university administrations to consider going forward. I want to jump in there and quickly also say we've been talking about our graduate admission process as well. And COVID has made um, the issue of the GREs really salient. You know, some students couldn't take, home, um, excuse me, couldn't take the GREs, et cetera. And many um, universities and programs have um, let that go for this year. And we've been talking about what it would look like to let that go indefinitely, um, given the work that we know around testing. So I think it's important for departments to have really um, good conversations about what an admission process would look like for graduate students. 
if you remove the requirement of the GREs and how to best evaluate students across difference in that context. Yeah, I think another uh, element too um, is to do analyses on, in terms of the department pipeline analyses in particular, right? So not all departments uh, or institutions suffer from the same issues as one clear example. Is there, if you look at the pipeline and the applicant pool, what in terms of diversity or, uh, you know, people from underrepresented or disadvantaged backgrounds, is there an issue in terms of attracting people and the entry into the applicant pool or is there an issue from the you know they're applying they're just not getting in which is sort of where a, a lot of diversity training comes in but unfortunately we've seen this with this year in terms of a lot of people a lot of departments putting um webinars about their program online to attract more students especially from underrepresented backgrounds to apply but i think it's really important in terms of uh, racial or ethnic minorities, in terms of sexual and gender minorities, in terms of disability, having the data on the department, whether it's, you know, climate surveys done in a, you know, private confidential way, of course, but what's going on in the department in terms of experiences, and then also pipeline analyses to make sure that the solutions are actually targeting the real issue in the department and not just kind of a little bit vague, you know, or sort of really focusing on where are the issues. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we've got um, a, a second uh, general question next. Um, so, sorry. So some viewers might be wondering about how to to start this process of asking or helping with changes on their campus or in the departments. Um, do any of you have any tips for for those people to uh, come to the best pathways to change uh, teaching or research spaces, working with the the people who have potentially more power and um, the, the higher ups, as it were? Um, I can start. Um, so I have, um, so in my experience at um, my university, I happened to join with a cohort of other people who were interested in diversity. And so, you know, we all started as assistant professors with a lot of power and, and not a lot of bandwidth, right? Um, but it was really helpful for us to um, kind of form what was initially an informal group and then more of a formal network. Um, and we attracted other people um, who had been at the university longer. And so kind of with that strength in numbers and solidarity, we were eventually able to attract um, people with the bandwidth and, you know, connections to uh, be able to have these conversations with people higher up and also people who were more aware of the kind of existing politics and how to navigate them. Um, so yeah, I would really encourage informal kind of um, identity or diversity based networking at first. Thank you. Um, did any of our other panelists want to jump in on this question? Um, I think I would I would co-sign on things John was saying earlier and that one good way of sort of figuring out where to help and how to help to start these efforts is by using data. I find particularly when you're discussing issues related to diversity, not all ears are as open as others, but data is data and you can't really argue with it. So I would strongly encourage if you are starting these efforts in a given department or university to get as much data as possible because then there's nothing that anyone can argue with. Um, I think another way to get data is also using, there's been some Q&A questions linked to graduate student involvement. Oftentimes graduate students are a little more in tune with undergraduate kind of environment con contextual issues. Um, so talking with your students and really getting to know them, which I know sounds like something we should all be doing normally, um, is really, really critical in making sure that all voices are heard. So if you are going to start surveying, don't forget about the staff in your department as well. They're another group that often gets overlooked in trying to build inclusive spaces. Um, so from undergrad staff, grad students, postdocs are another forgotten bunch of people as well. Um, so really collect that data and then present it to the key party members. If you're an early career scholar, I have found in my short career at Duke that finding friends in high up places can really, really help you, but you need to find the right friends. So talk to um, you know, secret friends on campus, you can figure out which administrators may be more or less um, prone or open to discussions of changing curriculums or hiring practices or whatever the case may be, and go through those avenues first, rather than jumping all the way up to the top of an administrative system. So those are just some other pieces of advice. 
And Guys, I think super ten oh no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, I agree with everyone else, and I also wanted to answer this question in a so in um as it relates to a question also put in the chat, I believe, about decolonizing the curriculum and how to go about that. I think this is a big part of it as well. And so when we talk about decolonizing the curriculum, it uh, relates to some of the things I noted about trying to integrate more diverse voices and ideas in a stats course, for example. Um, but it's really trying to think of a way to integrate or reimagine how other ways of knowing and culture um, can inform our best practices in research, um, for example. And so a good place to start there are our really close cousins in social psychology of um, cultural psychology. I know a lot of us lean heavily there um, as we do a lot of our work. So it would be really important to look at some um, authors. I think of Theo Salter and Glenn Adams and Hazel Marcus and other people who've done really great work. Um, Sarah Townsend, Stephanie Freiberg, just to give a few shout outs, you know, to people who do great work in this area and think of other ways and methods of interrogating these questions um, in our work. And so associated with looking at some of the lists um, that we've provided, the BIPOC list, for example, looking at other closely aligned fields um, to social psychology or integrated fields can help us do that as well. I can, for 10 seconds, I'll just say again about the data, but just really encouraging and, and building on what Valerie said too, we're so accustomed to thinking about in social psychology, the collection of data with respect to diversity and these issues. But if you think of your cognitive neuroscience faculty, your vision science faculty, or certainly outside of psychology in terms of physics, for some of the advocacy you need to do with diversity, it is so critical to have data because these individuals are not used to thinking about research on diversity the way that we are, right? So some of the issues, if it's just in the social psychology area, we all generally you know, under, are accustomed to this kind of research. But outside of social psychology, people are scientists are not used to these issues in terms of data and the way that we are. So really, I would encourage people to perspective take a little bit and arm themselves with data to advocate for what they'd like to be doing. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, uh, uh, the next question um, is, is directed, I guess, mostly to Sarah and Valerie, but Kathleen and John, do feel free to jump in. Um, what this is, and this builds on um, some of what you were talking about earlier, Sarah, but what are some of the tips um, that you have for making virtual classroom spaces more inclusive for students from underrepresented backgrounds, given that at least for the foreseeable future, it's we're going to be doing a lot of our work online and virtually. Yes, yeah, so I think there's lots of different approaches people can take. Um, the, the question of requiring video cameras on versus off is always a big debate. It can make a classroom feel more inclusive in some ways, but for some students who might be living in environments or situations where they can't have their backgrounds on, so making sure you do have an option for students um, so that they don't feel forced to disclose parts of their life that they might not want to. I think that's really, really critical during our COVID times. Also having multiple ways for students to participate. Um, I was teaching a social identities course this past semester and found that about half of my class felt more inclined or better capable of speaking on Zoom because they thought it was less scary than being in person. And the other half of the class actually thought it was more terrifying because you're literally staring at people's faces. Um, so making sure you are not requiring your participation grades in just one way, again, because the Zoom platform has impacted different students in different ways. Um, the other things that I've done a lot is making sure that there's um, interactive methods between the students within a classroom. I think one thing we lose a lot in a COVID context is students actually feeling like they know each other. So I know everyone uses breakout rooms, but you should be creative with your breakout rooms. I find using Google Docs alongside of breakout rooms really helps keep students focused and they all feel like they can contribute ideas just by typing, even again, if their video cameras are off. Um, so I encourage all of you to think flexibly on those breakout room activities because it really can help make your class actually feel like a class in person again. Yes, um, and picking back up uh, from there, I agree with all Sarah said and noted about breakouts. And I, I strongly encourage them as well because students just can talk more when we do the think pair share in person, for example, you know, students are more likely to become engaged when we do that and to have warm-ups um, at the beginning of the class um, as well. Even as cheesy as they can be, 
you'll find the undergrads giggle and laugh and, and do these sorts of things. Um, so this semester I taught a hundred plus person social intro to social class and I was thinking about how to do this. And so um, we actually integrated activities to help people become more engaged in a way that I think is even more engaging than when we taught in person. So I think I wanna save some of these things for uh, when we go back in, but it involved us breaking the class of 100 into pods, um, into sections of 25. And each section of 25 had pods of five that they remained in relationship with to do a few, a series of group projects and individual projects throughout the semester. And the students really liked that, especially when they learn about social loafing and all the social facilitation and all of these ideas. Um, and it really helped them to gain close relationships with a few students in the class that they stayed with and were able to um, perform on various assignments throughout the run of the course. And we um, met with the class in these sections of 25 for 35 or 45 minutes and sort of rotated between myself and my grad TA. So I got to actually see 25 at a time and talk to them face to face, quote unquote, via Zoom and do that. So I thought it was good um, to do that and integrate other kind of activities such as a meme, um, uh, doing cartoons, comic strips and various things in group projects to um, low stakes group projects to help students gain relationships as well. And I found this to be particularly important for students who are more isolated um, or particular, particularly underrepresented students as well. Great, thank you. Um, so we're just gonna move on to our last planned question before we're gonna to get to some of the uh, Q&A um, questions. We've got lots coming in, it's very exciting. Um, so this last question, um, John and Kathleen, um, for our early career members, um, how do you balance being an advocate for diversity and inclusion while also navigating the tenure process? Because of course, while we would hope in an ideal world, the two would be aligned, um, sometimes they might not be. Um, well, you know, I, I think I uh, kind of already talked a bit about what my experience was like kind of developing those um, informal networks in the beginning. Um, and that was really helpful for me in my early career. You know, the other thing um, was you know, kind of being very strategic about um, the work that I did. So, you know, being sure that the work that I did uh, both filled my, my personal bucket of wanting to do advocacy and diversity work, um, as, long, as well as filled the job description bucket of teaching, research, and service, right? Um, so that meant focusing as much as I could on, you know, um, service avenues that, uh, that would move forward, um, you know, diversity and advocacy. Um, it also meant making some strategic connections with different um, advocacy organizations. So early on, I connected with, with some rare disease and disability groups, and that really uh, actually checked a lot of boxes because I ended up on some advisory boards. Um, I learned a lot more about the population um, and I developed, you know, trust and relationships with these groups that helped me uh, recruit participants. Um, so, you know, picking like one or two strategic connections that way uh, can be really helpful. Thank you. Um, great question. To be honest, I didn't really start my advocacy in terms of the National Science Foundation and that kind of public pressure until after tenure because I, it's so my, so I think there are plenty of things that I, of course, have cared about these issues forever. And you can certainly do things in terms of working in terms of your own institution, your own lab your own uh, you know at SPSP etc um, and but in terms of I think certain things that unfortunately fall out of the realm of kind of mainstream stem diversity discussions um, I I don't think necessarily are the safest thing to do pre-tenure necessarily not to not to advise someone not to do it but I wouldn't say you know sending, um, federal register responses to White House OMB about the National Science Foundation is a good idea without tenure. You know what I mean? So I, 
um, not to stymie anyone's desires to do this. I just mean, personally, um, I definitely waited until after tenure. I didn't feel like it was appropriate for me to do it, do it beforehand just because it was too risky. Um, but I think that said, in terms of just helping to make a difference in your community, you can absolutely do lots of things in, you know, pre-tenure. Um, and many of the things Kathleen mentioned seem right, you know, completely the right way to go. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're gonna move to some of the Q&A questions now. So we're gonna start with the one that um, has been upvoted the most. So it's right at the top. Um, so anonymous attendee has written, I've started looking at including the work of more diverse researchers into my teaching and the SPSP database of BIPOC researchers is useful for that. But how do students know that researchers are diverse in terms of race, able-bodiedness, sexuality, et cetera, without tokenizing and labeling the researchers? Um, great question. Um, so feel free to jump in any, any of the panelists. I can chime in briefly here. I think one way, if it is a visible identity, I know that was one other question that was posted as well, is actually adding pictures of whoever the authors are on your lecture slides is super important. It puts a face to the name. It can help people recognize them if it is a student that might be at a conference later on, whether it's a grad course or an undergrad course that you might be teaching. So I find just including pictures can help to a certain extent um, for some visible identities. For invisible identities, one benefit I think of this COVID world that we're all in is by having guest speakers come to your class or to have guest speakers pre-record a lecture. And you can ask that individual if they happen to belong to a certain underrepresented group to disclose it themselves, right? That way you're not necessarily disclosing someone's identity for them if it's not an identity that they're comfortable with. But I find these pre-recorded short guest lectures, A, students love them, and B, it can help you know, decolonize your curriculum as some of these questions have been coming in as well. And giving the voice to that individual from that particular underrepresented group, giving them the platform I think is really important as we're starting to shift in the direction of um, fostering more anti-bias curriculum efforts. I guess I, I have one thing to add, and, and um, I, I, I'm not 100% sure how I feel about it, so it may be a bit controversial, but um, for those more invisible identities that, that Sarah was alluding to, um, you know, which includes most disabilities, most disabilities are not visible, um, I you know, would encourage researchers who feel comfortable doing so, and, and teachers, to disclose those identities, um, you know, uh, so coming out in that way uh, can help students to understand. It can also model that behavior among students. Not that everyone needs to, you know, always disclose this sort of information, but it can be helpful if um, that is it, that is how you're feeling at that point. Yes, I, I think that's a really important point um, for researchers where they can and they do feel comfortable to disclose that, um, you know, have, for example, the rainbow flags on Twitter, um, like on their names and also something I do in class, you know, be open about difficulties with depression or anxiety or mental health to make them know that um, the faculty also experience this. And so that's something that I personally found very useful, although they are not here for me. So that's the only thing I'm going to say in this whole webinar. Um, did um, any of the other any of the other panelists have anything to add here? I, if not, I, we're going to move to yes. I can just super quickly say that you know all the the studies and the data on undergraduate STEM experiences suggest that you know STEM identif identifying with the field with STEM um, and a sense of belonging is key to retention, especially from senior to uh, sorry from freshman to senior year. And if we want to keep people, as everyone's saying, right, bring them into our field, keep them in our field, I think these issues are so critical, right? In term, and one of the ways you can do that is obviously from having clear role models or clear, you know, sites of researchers doing that. So I think in some ways it's, it's a responsibility of us to make sure that we keep people in our field and don't have people feel like they're not belonging. But I do think that especially with, you know, invisible or st stigmatized and visible identities that it is challenging. And I think kind of differs for each individual researcher about the degree to which they wanna be 
kind of out and visible or not. And it, it does have to be a bit of a kind of personal choice about how they feel at that moment, you know? Great, thank you. Um, so um, we've talked already um, a bit, um, a, a few of the panelists have talked about decolonizing the cur curriculum. So I think we'll move to this next question, um, which is about hiring. So um, another autonom uh, autonomous, anonymous attendee has said, I'm in a small liberal arts college and we've been doing most of the best practices in encouraging diversity hiring. However, our department and to a large degree, the college is not diverse. So we've made offers to diverse applicants, but we worry that they don't feel that they'll fit in. Um, and so this person is asking, what else can they do? Um, feel free, anyone to, to jump in again. I can start. I'm not at a small liberal arts college, so this might not be as applicable in that context. But I know one popular thing we're seeing right now in the job market across um, across the U.S. in particular are cluster hires. And so one way you can help reduce the tokenizing that a new person may be feeling on a given campus is to make sure that they're not the only one. Right. We realize many people have to be the first one from an underrepresented background before there can be a second or a third, but it can be very daunting to be that first one in that space. And so cluster hires, it doesn't have to all be within the same department, but maybe there's a theme on focusing on inequality or focusing on, um, you know, family, family struggles, right? There's some sort of theme across a campus. And so getting a university to sponsor multiple hires in multiple departments, if one department can't afford more than one hire in a given year, um, has been shown to help recruit people successfully and also to retain them longer because then you come in with a cohort. Um, I know when I was hired at Duke, um, I am a biracial black white identified individual and there were two other black faculty hired the same year I was in totally different departments, but we are now best friends because we were all hired together. Um, and that really made a big difference in us um, making Duke feel more like at ho a home for us as well. So that would be one suggestion to pitch to your university. Another thing I would note is to, to the extent that faculty feel comfortable um, speaking, faculty from different departments feel comfortable speaking to um, potential hires um, that they, that departments ask if they are willing to talk to them or reach out to them. So talk to them about the area. One thing is like where to live, for example, where is a safe space to be? Where do you get certain types of food? And sometimes you, you know, you have to speak to particular people in the university or colleges or just the area that are more familiar with these spaces. And so these very low stakes phone conversations or Zoom calls with potential hires, I find have been really important across all sorts of um, identities to help people really make a, a more informed decision whether they're willing to step out and go into a place um, where they may be um, um, few of uh, their group on a particular campus. And then it helps them to build a cohort if there are no cluster hires available at the time, for example, which I think are absolutely great. Um, it can help build a, a cohort prior to them arriving. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we've got time for one or two more questions before we wrap up. Um, I thought this was um, a very interesting question. How do people make sure that their efforts around diversity and inclusion are really helping others? Um, how do we know that the, uh, the processes that we're trying to implement are having the desired outcome? I can just briefly say, keeping on my theme of data, um, but no, data would pro would be a great idea to confirm, both in terms of what representation and disparities, but also in terms of, of course, experiences in terms of self-reported experiences done, of course, in a private, confidential, anonymous way, whether in a department or a university or you know or at SPSB, for example. It all comes down to, I think, data and pipeline analyses and understanding the experience. One other tool I've heard that's been helpful too at a number of different departments is having a, sounds very corny, um, but it goes back to kindergarten days, a what bugs you box kind of thing where it's an anonymous way to submit 
something that might not be great in a given department or curriculum or, and that way it's an anonymous way. Um, usually if it's a physical box, then students don't have to freak out about IP address tracking and these kinds of things, which everyone is very concerned about, particularly in a Zoom world now. Um, so if there are anonymous ways for students, whether it's grad students or undergrads in particular, to be able to voice their concerns, that can also help alleviate some of the power dynamic differences, because um, often it is faculty and administration who are making these changes that end up impacting students, and we don't often have clear enough um, telephone lines between us and them. And so the more options you have um, to get that data, as John's saying, I think the better. One, one brief thing that comes up often with this issue is that, you know, I, we're, when we're talking about the National Science Foundation, we're talking about very, very large samples of, you know, 150,000, et cetera. But in terms of a department, issues of privacy and confidentiality become a lot more real because there's 30 people in a department or 100 people in a department. So how could you possibly get in demographic information on sex orientation and gender identity or on disability? What and then who's looking at the data and, and you can, of course, suppress data cells that don't have enough sample where you risk identifiability, which is how the National Science Foundation does it too and the appropriate way to do it. But point is you can, if there is a little bit of money, hire an outside person, it doesn't have to be too expensive to be an independent person who collects the data and ensure that things aren't you know, cross tabulated in a way that could Id risk identifying any individual persons. So I just mean to say that Sometimes people are turned off by collecting this kind of information in, in a small sample in a department, but there are ways to remedy that and don't shy away from trying to have an objective understanding of the experiences going on in your department or you know, just because of a, a small sample issue. There are ways to rectify that. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and so I think this will be our last question. Um, the attendee had directed this um, more towards Kathleen, but I think this is something where each of our panelists will be able to, to give some guidance. Um, so this person has written that the informal networking idea is excellent, which I very much agree with. Um, do you have any ideas or suggestions of, about how you might start that process? Like, how did you determine who to reach out to? I think this relates to your um, your answers earlier as well, Sarah. Um, yeah, how do you start that process? All right. Um, so, you know, I took advantage of all the kind of um, socializing and networking opportunities when I first started my job. So we had an extensive, probably too extensive, you know, four day orientation when we started and a lot of new faculty mixers and stuff. Um, so, so actually everyone in this um, network I talk about um, were people who were not in my department to, to kind of go to Sarah's point as well. Um, so often it really does involve um, going out of your comfort zone, um, you know, and, and meeting people that way. Um, we also took advantage of the, uh, the, the OSU listservs, you know, to send out information and try to get more people involved once we started actually meeting and we had, um, you know, nice events with food and stuff like that. So that's always, um, you know, a great way to encourage people to come along. I think one other thing I'd add is um, <clears throat> Duke, st <clears throat> sorry, Duke started a mentoring committee option for all new faculty. Um, which was created within our department, but we had a say in which faculty we sort of wanted to mentor us along the way, and it could be people outside of your department. Um, so if you don't have a mentoring program in place at your university or college, I would strongly encourage you. It gives you a, a set of faculty you can email with any questions at any point, particularly being a junior faculty member. It's really important to not feel like you're bothering people, right? It's something that a lot of us struggle with, um, particularly underrepresented faculty or when you're working with underrepresented students. Um, and another thing that um, is something you could think about is I realize funding and financial situations are very much in question right now in our COVID world, um, but getting small grants through universities, oftentimes there are community-based grants to build community between faculty um, or between faculty and grad students. So if you wanted to start a minority writing group or something like that, um, there are ways that universities usually have small amounts of money to sponsor breakfast or things like that once a week, which can be really nice ways to also build community. Thank and you. Um, Sarah, oh, sorry, go ahead, Valerie. Sorry. Um, along with those suggestions, I was also going to suggest some of the um, broader non-disciplinary specific 
support groups that are available. For example, the National Center for Diversity Development and for, for Faculty Development and Diversity, um, led by Carrie Ann Rockamore and colleagues. And um, it can be a bit expensive, but a lot of institutions will support to pay for a portion of it. A lot of institutions have institutional memberships. So you can watch a lot of the webinars um, and you can take these 14 day writing challenges where you meet online with other people. Um, it's not for a particular group at all. You can join from a graduate student to an administrator and sort of be in um, groups of people across disciplines who are at the same stage. And so that helps to form these networks. And I've met quite a few friends from different areas that I stay in contact with from being involved in these sorts of programs over the years as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Um, I mean, I, I know I uh, have found this really informative. It's given me a lot of ideas of things that I can be doing in my own work and um, pushing the department. And I'm sure that the attendees have found it just as useful as me. So thank you so much for taking the time um, to do this. Um, it was really wonderful. Um, to all the attendees, um, we will be sending out a post-webinar survey. Um, just ask you, you know, what you thought went well, what could be improved, and this will just help SPSP um, plan these events in future. And in that email, we're also gonna be sending some of the links of the uh, resources and lists and things that we uh, talked about in this session so that you can have those there. Um, Thank you, everybody. Um, I've just got the announcement that it's uh, time up. So thank you. Have a lovely day. And um, goodbye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.